Um, so your life, as we were talking about before, I actually have a public account. We're going to get to the company here in a second, but I'm really excited about my little project I'm going to do with Roman, Leo, and Silas will be a, by, a, a bystander of letting them help me pick stocks on public and then show them how to leverage the community, which we'll talk about to kind of educate them on stock picking and get them introduced to investing. So I think that the, the platforms were cool. And I'm really excited about having you here because also as I shared with you, the goal for the, this round of All About Your Benjamins is to expose listeners to new upcoming companies that are leveling the playing field when it comes to investing or giving us access to ways of investing we didn't have before. And I can't honestly tell you how public came up on my radar, I forget, but I've been following you guys for a while and I really like it. So um, I thought this was a great company to put on everybody's radar. Before we get too deep into the company, how about you give us a quick high level rundown of your background? Your entrepreneurship is something that I really love and it's something that's near and dear to this podcast and you are an entrepreneur. So maybe share a little bit of your story and then we'll dive into public. Yeah, first Justin, thanks for having me. So, uh, you know, to bring that all the way. Um, hey, so first off, I'm German. That's where the beautiful accent comes from. Uh, so just to give a quick dis uh, disclosure here up front. Um, exactly. A, so I kind of stumbled into this stuff really just based off literally building websites for video games out of my kid's room back in the day. Literally when I was like 14, 15, started building websites for video games and I'm doing much of like affiliate marketing stuff, learn how to basically make money online. And that kind of, you know, brought me into that, started studying design back in Germany and so on. Ended up in the agency world for a little while. Um, basically, you know, once, you know, uh, kind of like digital was, 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 you know, kind of sporing up and, you know, becoming more important in the world, so to say. And then um, moved to the US in 08 right before the financial crisis hit. Um, perfect timing. I wasn't affected too much. I guess I was too cheap at the time, which, is, uh, which was a you know, blessing in disguise, I guess. And um, I said, I moved first to, to Boulder, Colorado, actually. That was my first stint in the US. There was an ad agency back there called Chris and Potter Bogusky, And that was you know, quite, quite famous at the time. And then um, ended up in New York at another thing called RGA, um, again, agency side. And then you know, from there, started a small company called Pay With A Tweet, like a social media payment system. Um, where like where it's more about the exposure to your network, right? You click a pay the tweet button. It's you know to for example download a song or download you know get access to like an ebook or you know a discount on a ticket at an event or things like that. And that thing kind of just blew up organically to a point where like every major record label used it, and you know Mitt Romney used it when he ran for president. Sorry about that. Uh, didn't work out. So all fine. Um, and um, and uh, exactly, and then you know, ended up in SF, worked with some tech startups there. Um, RDO, the former Spotify competitor, a little bit of Venmo, and um, yeah. And then when I moved back to New York, I joined this, um, I joined this uh, like venture firm slash um, venture studio called Prehype in New York. And um, my deal, so to say, with Henrik, the guy who started it, which is it's a Danish guy. Um, um, and so uh, like the deal that we had was a sense of, okay, I joined pre and I'm going to start a company out of it. No idea what it would be yet, but it was just like, I you know, knew that I wanted to start something again. That's kind of where I started in the very early beginning and, um, and kind of ended up in agency land and, you know, wasn't a big fan of it while I was in it um, at some point. And so, um, and so we had this little, this little kind of deal going on of like, okay, I'm going to start a company out of it. And so I think like a year, a year and a half into pre-hype, um, I started this company called Endco, which is like a freelancing software, mm -hmm. um, kind of like SaaS to run your business, invoicing, task management, all that kind of stuff. Um, and that um, then later on was acquired by Fiverr. Um, and then obviously Fiverr IPO'd, um, Enco still exists until this day. It's an own, you know, it's kind of like a subsidiary of Fiverr. Um, and, um, and then basically, you know, um, once I, once, once I left Fiverr and Enco, um, I basically joined my buddy Yannick, um, who's a Danish guy who I know also from Henrik, the guy who started Prehype. And so we, you know, he was, he was, he was like a mentor to me and also like a mentor to, 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 to Yannick. And so that's why we knew each other for many years. Um, and then we kind of coupled up to, to, to uh, run what's now known public. So that's a very quick little rundown. Yeah. So little known fact, people don't know this, but i make sure I can say it right. Ich spreche ein paar Deutsch. So from sixth grade and through my junior year of high school, I took German. Um, and funny enough. Very uh, useful. Yeah, so my, <laughs> my German teacher is actually one of my clients. So I'm going to make sure I send her this podcast episode so she can hear me speak a little bit. 
Um, but from that story, like a couple of takeaways, we don't have to dive down, but I just want to point yeah. out just like, you know, the entrepreneur path is kind of finding your way and moving around and, and gathering all these experiences. And then the other big thing that led you to public is, you know, networking, having a strong network, knowing people, because you never know what connection is going to lead to that next opportunity. 100%. I guess my, my big question from the whole story is like, wh- how did you land on stocks? Like, how did you land on a trading platform? What, what led you guys there? Cause it doesn't sound like you were in, I mean, I guess maybe there's some finance in the company that Fiverr bought, but um, it doesn't sound like you've always been an investor doing all this stuff. That, like, this is the obvious idea. Yep. So a couple of things. I'm going to go a little bit back now, but we have the time. So we'll try. Um, so when I was always thinking of making steps, always to prioritize experience over experience over immediate compensation. And I think if you follow um, if you follow a sense of basically trying to make your career moves to kind of gain experience, money will always follow. And what comes out of it is also that you likely, at least my, at least my, my opinion, that you build more of a resilient career because um, you will never go after these gigs that will basically pay money, right? So likely often the, the types of jobs and gigs that will pay you the most will be the ones that um, where the job itself might be, you know, painful and so that's hence why i always call it pain money um and and with that you will likely box yourself into a situation where at some point you're at, you know something where it's maybe harder to make a move out of you box yourself into a lifestyle that you know you have to finance etc 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 um and so and so with that i think it's it also kind of falls into whatever move you make basically looking at it like a semester and looking at it as like, what am I actually learning? Like, what am I gaining now from a pref- from, a, from like my pref- professional experience, so to say, like you know, or like um, with the move that I'm making. So that it's not just, hey, I'm perfect at this one thing. I'm going to apply this now. I'm going to be the smartest guy in the room. But that there's always this notion of, you know, this, you know, period in time in my life. Where is it? You know, what what is it going to add uh, to me? What I'm going to take away from that? And um, and I think one major thing that, that I had when I was in, 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 in the, when I was in the uh, agency land was a sense of that everything you worked on really didn't have a much longevity because it was some ad campaign. It was, you know, if you were making product work, it was often something that wasn't really a company, it was just like, you know, an app you made somewhere and so on. And so, um, um, and so things were just fairly shallow and you weren't really going deep. And I think that's also why when you talk to product people who come out of agency land, they will always kind of think of, you know, oh, I want to do multiple products. I want to do a product studio, blah, 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 because if, because you, you haven't necessarily had the experience and learn to get the joy out of going deep. And so with Enco, I think, and then starting that company, I really l- learned to love to go deep. And that was for me really something where I was a king of side projects before. I was always doing all these little fun kind of tools and whatnot on the side and, you know, having developer friends just like make all this stuff and put it in product hunt and blah, 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 blah. And, um, and really kind of like this like shift to learn to love to go deep. Mm-hmm. And when you do that, that that is really when you grow. And um, I really still think that now and what I'm doing now and what I've basically doing since I'm, you know, sort of say like a more serious entrepreneur for lack of better wording. um, I really feel how I leave home pretty much every day and I feel how I've grown. I feel how I've really learned something. And I think in, in, you know, many jobs I had before that wasn't necessarily always the case. And so, and so with that, um, you know, um, I think, you know, as an entrepreneur, I think it's not necessarily always the case that you must have a lot of experience in the field you're going into. And I think often it can also be a handicap if you do, because then you will think of the way it always has been done, or you kind of you know, grew up with certain restrictions. And I think a certain AVT will, will kind of also help you to kind of truly disrupt something. Um, and so I think that's that's just like the 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 like quick background there. And then so Marco von Ayanek actually is very deep from the from the fintech space. Like his former company is called Tradable, uh, which was like a B two B trading app in, in uh, back in back in Europe, run out of London. And um, and that's really um, and so and so he has a deep kind of industry experience. Um, um, those myself, and so there is some there. Um, and also like our engineering team is like very deep, you know, um, uh, obviously fintech experience. But for me, you know, as kind of like a startup growth guy, 
um, it was really much more of like taking the principles that I've learned that I kind of, you know, gained in terms of how to hack attention and applying that to the space and then really learning the domain expertise, you know, while doing. So sticking on this entrepreneurship, we're, I promise everybody, we're going to get to public, but I had no idea life was going to take us down this path. Like this could be the whole thing to be about entrepreneurship. But <laughs> Sorry. You, you, no, no, this is great. I love it. This is phenomenal. So you mentioned you were the, like the side project king. And I can, I can, I can understand that because you know, I have an advisory firm. I have clients I work with, but I, ha- I help co-launch a community for financial advisors. I have a t-shirt shop that I run on Shopify that is for financial advisors. Like I get these little small projects and I have friends that are like, you know, you got to go deep. You know, it's uh, what is it? Inch wide, mile deep type of philosophy for those entrepreneurs out there that are still struggling with getting to that depth. Was there anything that you can credit to being able to say, okay, I'm going to shut the side projects down and I'm going all in. I think sometimes maybe, like I'm, I'm big on doing what you're passionate about and maybe it's finding that one thing that, okay, this is the thing that I'm so passionate about that I don't even want to do the side projects and it's finding your way. But is there anything that, that in your experience allowed you to shut those off and go all in on what you're doing? Um, I really think there are two aspects here. Number one, it's the aspect of um, having a framework for yourself on how to pick the right idea. Um, and there's, there's multiple aspects and it's connected to your own ambitions and all that kind of stuff, right? So for myself, it's something I want to, I want to be in markets that are massive where I can build something that, you know, truly has a, that can truly be a mass, you know, um, in this case now, like in public, like a mass consumer company, mm-hmm. when theory, anyone above the age of 18 could be a public user and can have it on their home screen. Um, and, um, and therefore, for example, that already kind of, creates a certain you know restriction in terms of what types of ideas you might pursue um i have a couple of other things like one thing that i've learned out of um out of out of running public for example when i was running public i really enjoyed the investor pitches and so on i really enjoyed the investor pitches because they were much more about like the future of work where were things going and there was this like certain kind of you know um like intellectual aspect there you know that was that was just you know fun and you know inspiring um in the day to day, I had to manage SEO articles around what if my client doesn't pay my invoice, right? And so, and that's the stuff that suddenly, you know, is your day to day. And so I recognized, you know, with running Enco, really one new principle where I was like, okay, with the next thing, I should make sure that if I would have like a dinner party with my, uh, with my, with my users, with my customers, um, would I enjoy the conversations, mm-hmm. right? So if I would go deep then there in that, in, you know, at, at that dinner table with those people, like, would I really enjoy the conversations, right? And, um, and with my old company, there would definitely be a bunch of aspects where, where, where I would have been like, oh, do I really now enjoy talking about like the nitty gritty details of a freelance contract all the time? You know, it's, you know, maybe not. But with public, I know that if you would have dinner party with a bunch of my like 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 of our users right now, you would discuss the latest IPOs. You would discuss you know the future of Amazon and Shopify. You would discuss you know uh, certain business strategies, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I just really enjoy that stuff. And so therefore, you know, everything that is kind of surrounded in the day to day of public are things that I actually personally really enjoy. And that just makes it obviously way easier, right? And that's, again, that's just something for myself. Like there are a lot of people out there who can just, you know, basically suck their joy out of, out of um, you know, purely building and scaling a business, um, no matter what the space that might be in. Um, but I really recognize for me that, you know, even when I go deep in certain aspects, you know, even just, in, you know, I think, uh, you know, I think uh, um, SEO article somewhere or so on, that, that I feel like there's still something where I should, you know, care about at the end of the day. No, I, I agree. Like, I think that there's the saying that like, it's not work if you're enjoying it or like there's some cheesy line about that, but it's true. And I think that being an entrepreneur you know, is a lot of time and work that goes into building a company. And if you're not enjoying it, then you could easily burn out. But if you're surrounding yourself with, like you said, the people and the conversations and the work that you enjoy, then it doesn't seem like work. You're, you're doing something that, that is a lot of fun. Let's, let's get to what is a lot of fun. So we've mentioned public bunch. I introed it on the intro, but um, I, I was doing my research, mainly trying to figure out how to make sure I say the right name first, and I, right? And I didn't do it. I couldn't find it. But I was watching a video that the very first slide said, like, 
for, for public, it says, we're on the mission to accelerate all people's prosperity by making the public markets accessible to everyone. Is that kind of the, the official vision for public or kind of tell us what you envision public doing, what the goal is for the company? So we actually adjusted that kind of mission statement a little bit um, since the show we got to from. But basically, like where we're like what we're saying right now is always this: making the market inclusive, like making the stock market inclusive, educational, and fun. And I think a big aspect there is really the sense of um, the stock market seems scary because the culture around it is. And if you look at any type of community that has been created around the stock market it's very heavily white male dominated it's kind of bro culture right it's wolf of wall street memes and showing off your quick gains on some penny stock and you know what's your what's the hot stock tip like that is the culture that you have around stock trading so far and so if you look at any you know historically any community that has been built around the stock market it's kind of represent it's kind of it's kind of you know encompassing that it's kind of representing that and so one big thing that we've that we truly believe is that to truly democratize the stock market you have to change its culture and that's really kind of where it starts and if you look at just you know fintech in general on you know the 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 development you've seen is that in the past it has been very heavily about um just you know access and access through um, making things easier UI on mobile, access through making things cheaper. Um, and basically a lot of work has been done on just some underlying infrastructure and fintech and so on. Um, but still, if you look at most fintech companies out there right now, at the end of the day, they're all trying, to, they're all still running on the same playbook in most cases. And, you know, where they're basically trying to rebundle back into a bank and, you know, then they have the loan products and their debit cards and all that kind of stuff. Um, but where democratization is not just about access and so not just making these tools available for everyone, but also it's, it's about making these things approachable to people. And so if it's around the stock market, which is one of the topics, you know, where people are maybe, you know, um, the most kind of like scared about because they think that they need their, you know, financial advisor and so on to, to you know, ever get started and they need, you know, a few thousand dollars to get started and all that kind of stuff is that that approachability really comes from, you um, comes from um, not just making the set, like not just you know, opening up uh, uh, the tools for everyone, but to actually make it more approachable um, through things like community, through things like breaking down, you know, um, you know, the learnings on the stock market in formats that people understand, et cetera. And so and that's why we really started by building the social network around the stock market, because we believe that social is really um, a way to kind of scale education and to make it more approachable. You're really you know, consuming the stock market you know, in literally a feed the way you're used to you know, consume any other content, any other social app. Well, being that I spend my life in the world of finance, I agree with trying to disrupt the image that finance puts out there. Like that's, so you're, you're doing it on the consumer side, bringing technology to kind of break up the, the um, barriers to entry just from a perspective of looking at, the, that, at Wall Street like I'm trying to do it on the advisor side. Like I'm trying to get advisors, more and more advisors to tell their story and put themselves out there and not wear suits and be themselves and, and let people know that, you know, financial advisors, we're not all like the Wall Street, uh, Charlie Sheen characters or the Wolf of Wall Street. Like that's not what we are. We're actually people who want to help. And there's this image we have to overcome. I think one of the things that you, you didn't mention that you guys do a real good job of making it inviting is the user experience that public has. So, um, yeah, like I mentioned, I have an account, but it's super easy to set up. Um, you're using new technology. The only reason I'm aware of this is there's a company on the, on the financial advisor side called Altruist that's kind of trying to do the same thing. Uh, so I know Jason Wank real well. He's kind of a mentor of mine, but they're building digital account opening, kind of a very similar approach to what you're doing, but for advisors to use with their clients. But when you go to the public website, or you go to the public app, you know, it's bright colors, it's good images. It's, it's, uh, it's what I love about the tech world and the direct-to-consumer world as far as branding and imagery that the finance world, we're still using boats and navigation signs. That's old school. So when you look at this, honestly, and this, I don't think this is a bad thing, it doesn't look like a finance company. It looks like any other consumer brand that people are attracted to, um, but then now they get into it and it's, it's less daunting. So I think that that's something that you guys have done a good job of um, that I think attracts people to it. Yeah, thanks, man. 
I think it's also um, um, I think it's also that most fintech companies um, have been really still coming from very heavily the utility angle. And so we often say that in public or just generally people invest with the hearts and their brains, mm -hmm. but in finance, everything is very heavily built around the brains, right? It's very heavily about like the charts and numbers, the gains that you're getting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's very little about the heart. It's very little about the, I'm proud to be an owner of this company. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, I invest in this thing because it, you know, um, represents certain values that I have um, and so on. But that, um, is as much part of people's investing decisions as it is of, you know, the potential understanding of this could be a good investment from a pure financial perspective. And, um, and that is really something that, that, you know, we're trying to even like from a brand perspective, as well as, you know, how we run community and so on, really, really try to, you know, try to, try to, you know, kind of build a good experience around that um, at the end of the day, it's really the sense of that, Hey, you want to be able to, you know, show off what you, you know, kind of believe in. That's why like when you have a public portfolio, you know, and the companies that you kind of have in that, that it also says something about yourself, um, that the conversations you're having with other people in the app, that it's not just about, yo, what's a good stock tip, you know, where, you know, where can I flip something real quick, but it's very much about long-term investments and what you believe in into the future um, and so on. And so, um, and I think that is really something that, that, um, that we're trying to, um, kind of own to a certain extent because you know in the finance space in the fintech space i think it has been very little ex like been existing and there was that and, 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 and there was some like really cool examples like there was an example of um for example uh, throughout the black Lives matter protests the first ones that that um, um when they when they started happening um there were some um, um, um black women on the app who started buying the four um s and uh, s p 500 companies who are run by black ceos mm -hmm. in order to you know, shine light on the, on the point that there are only four. Mm -hmm. And that was like a little viral moment on the app as well. And so I think, you know, again, there are just a lot of these, 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 uh, uh, these types of things where it's not just about, you know, your charts and numbers and, you know, where you get the most gain out of, but it's also in a sense where you, you know, you place your money where your heart is. So there's a saying in the financial advisor space. I didn't come up with it. I wish I did, but personal finance is more personal than it is finance. And it's basically mm -hmm. what you're describing. Like there's the number side of it, but then as an investor, there's the emotional tie, there's the pride, there's the support that you want to lend. And it's mirroring both of those at the same time. I'm, I'm interested in diving deeper on community because I mentioned I have a community that I co-founded of advisors. So I understand and appreciate the value of community. There have been some other stock communities out there um, I guess one of the things that when we think about community and, and public platforms, like let's say Twitter, for example, there, uh, there are the trolls out there. There's negativity. There's how do you know what information is good information? And is, is somebody on the other side of this trade of the information they're putting out there? Is that still a, a, a risk? Because to be honest with you, I haven't dove real deep into the community side of public yet, but kind of are there metrics in place or is it just through your content, through your branding, through your messaging, the people that you're attracting aren't those types of people. They're people who are really collaborative. Because I know that a lot of times what makes a community strong is there's a like-mindedness. There's something underlying amongst all the people that's this, that ties them together. So maybe for public it is these people are interested in collaborating and learning together, not about trying to flip a better trade because they gave somebody misinformation. So kind of describe the community, how you've been able to grow it, and then how are you guys able to make sure that you keep out the riffraff if possible? Yep. Um, so exactly. And so on public, again, one thing we've done a lot of work on very early on is to actively not acquire the typical trader bro mm -hmm. for lack of better wording. <laughs> um, and but it's um, definitely a bro too. It's definitely a trader. It's bro. definitely, it's definitely a bro. It's definitely a white guy like us too. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> um, but basically, and, and because if we would have done that, we would have just ended up replicating the same type of community you already find out there online. Yeah. But it was very much about um, creating something that is way more inclusive, way more inviting, way more welcoming of people who are new to investing. And, you know, in public, if now you ask, you know, if you're new to something and you ask something that might seem from an experienced person, like a dumb question, you will likely get a serious answer from someone. Yeah. And I think that culture is heavily you know, obviously fueled by 
us having been very early on, very mindful of not just acquiring the low hanging fruits, but acquiring, you know, the right kind of tribes of people that, you know, we were building and designing the product for. And that really also then shapes the culture of the community in the first place. Then the second piece is obviously also having, you know, just, just having a tight grip on the actual culture in the community and, you know, and, and, you know, uh, what type of content creators are, you know, or people in general in the app are, you know, creating that resonates with people, um, you know, how that, uh, you know, bubbles up in the feeds, et cetera, et cetera. And then the other piece is that on public, you can only participate in the community if you have a fully approved brokerage account. Mm-hmm. And so we're often joking that we're likely the most verified social network in the history of social networks because you right. went through full KYC, through full identity verification. And so, and so that alone also just sets like a way higher quality of a baseline of a community because you don't, because it's not this like anonymous, um, you know, forum somewhere. Um, and, um, and it just keeps most bad actors already out. Um, and so that's, that's the one side. And the other thing is really what, 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 you know, we had many moments where maybe someone was coming in being a little nasty, but then actually the community suddenly starts to rally and, you know, defend the person that was maybe, you know, uh, was maybe attacked here or so on. And so that there, there were, you know, we've, we've seen many of these moments where it's not just us having to moderate or something, but where it's the community actually being protective, of, protective, protective of each other. And we often say that that is a sign not to tap ourselves on the shoulder too much, but like we often say that that is a sign of, of a true strong community because if you don't only care about, you know, your own posts or, you know, the people you follow us on, but you're caring about the culture of the community at large and you're there to kind of protect and defend it on your own without anyone telling you in the first place that that is off, that we see that that's kind of like a holy grail of like a healthy community, right? And so I'll for us, obviously, that. yeah, sorry, I'll, go ahead. I was, I'll pat you on the back for that because that's, <laughs> I mean, that, that's, that's, that you're right. That is, that is a signal of a true community to where, yes, they're community starters, but eventually the community takes over itself and self-governs and self-polices. And that's, that's phenomenal. I think that's what every community out there should strive to have. So you won't pat yourself on the back, but I, I will pat you, pat you on the back. That's, that's great. Um, and I just think that tells you everything that shows you that everything you're, you're doing as a company is resonating with the right people. You're bringing in the right people. The messaging is right. The experience is right for them that they have that pride that this app and, you know, they don't want it to see it get ruined. Um, so no, I think that's great. Yep. And I think the other side is also to be very clear of who you're for and, um, and being okay with that, that might shut some people out for the face of the company you're in at that moment. And, um, you know, one example is that, you know, we don't allow day trading on the app. Um, that's kind of like a five strike rule for, 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 for day trading um, we don't have margin accounts, right? So we don't give you margin loans necessarily, which, you know, obviously if you're not necessarily a super educated trader, that might also be a, you know, a very risky thing for you anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, we don't have options trading, for example. Um, and those were like mindful decisions so far. And we're not saying, we're, never, we're not saying that we're never going to do it, but I think when we do, there will be a very clear structure around it of how we will launch these features. Um, and, um, and I think that, again, just clarifies who the product is for and what kind of culture the community is really representing, right? So instead of margin and options, we have, for example, something called long-term portfolio, where you can drag a stock into your long-term portfolio, you can literally lock it in, and then you can share it to the community of like, why, do you, you know, why have you moved Amazon, for example, to your long-term portfolio? You can kind of share you know, what your thesis is for, you know, of, why you believe in this company for the long term? Um, you know, we have launched things like safety labels. So, for example, um, you know, securities that the SEC seems uh, deems as, as more risky, like you know, specialized ETFs and you know, um, you know, nano macro cap companies, so like very, you know, low um, uh, market cap companies, um, bankrupt companies, for example, right? Um, those companies actually have a safety label now. Um, that warns someone before they buy this, like before they buy into that stock, um, about the potential risks that might be connected to, you know, buying into a company like that or to into a security like that. And those were all like, 
you know, very mindful moves we have made in order to create a specific type of experience for a specific type of user. In our case, it also means it's a very mainstream and large audience, obviously, because we are very heavily currently also just, you know, focused on people who are new to investing, right? 90% of the people on public make their first self-directed investment on public. Um, but um, yeah, and so exactly. And so, and, so, and so I think that kind of focus and just clarity on who you're for, I think then also helps build a healthier, stronger community as well. But I love the fact that so much about what you guys are doing is instilling good investor behavior behind what they're doing. So cutting out the margin, cutting out the things that will most likely lead to a bad investing experience and will one, make the customer not happy with public because they're gonna attribute public to their bad experience and then may keep them out of investing for a long period of time and cause more harm. So you know, I love the idea of the long-term portfolio because you know it's teaching people to hold it for the long term. The no day trading is great. So from you know from a practitioner standpoint, I love seeing what you're building because it's instilling good behavior for investors in the future, which kind of ties me to the next kind of question. You mentioned knowing the right customer for the phase of where the company is. Kind of what's the the long term vision for public? Do you do you guys want to see public be the main investing place for? your customers, or is this kind of the place that, you know, investors go to scratch that itch where they want to pick individual securities, but the majority of their net worth is with an advisor in a, in a boring diversified ETF portfolio, kind of, where do you see public going? And what do you guys want to see happen? Hey, obviously the, you know, grand plans that we can dive into in the future at some point when things are more public, no pun intended, but, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, um, Hey, generally speaking, we are very comfortable in the position that we're at right now. And we think of the company really in phases of the maturity of the, of, of the company, the product itself. And so, you know, we always say that we are comfortable that for many people, we are right now the app where you have, where you have some play money and that we're not competing with your Vanguard account right now. And that is completely fine, right? And because it's not what we're trying to build at this moment in time, and it's not um, you know, who we're kind of like pretending to compete with or to be, right? That, that's, that doesn't make sense. And again, it comes, comes back to just being very clear on, on um, who you're for, what stage you're at, you know, in the stage of your company, et cetera, et cetera. Hey, as we mature, as, you know, obviously the company grows and, you know, with that also more products going to launch and all that kind of stuff, you know, there is obviously way more coming on the horizon, right? When you talk about other asset classes, when you talk about, you know, other types of people that could join the community, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, um, but currently we're just, you know, we are, we are very comfortable in the, in the kind of place we're at and we are really focused on doubling down on really, you know, building the social network for investing. So I operate in this mindset of abundance. There's more than enough people to help. You guys kind of sound like the same way. Like we're happy where we are now. I'm sure this is in the non-public information, so you don't have to say, but I think that if you guys continue to develop a community like you're building and you instill good investment behavior in your customers, I've got to imagine there's going to be a tremendous opportunity to cross over from a financial planning standpoint. So whether that is the public of the future, and you, you don't make any comments, I'm just throwing an idea out there. And go, I'm going to go back later on and see if, I have, if I'm right in any way. But the public of the future <laughs> could have, whether it be, you know, financial advisors on staff or in the future, enough technology that gives people the ability to do like a very basic financial plan. It's not going to get into complex situations and, you know, higher net worth people may, may actually need a financial advisor. But if you're talking about bringing accessibility and giving people exposure to this, if you can have a algorithm that runs some basic stuff and gives them a plan with some suggestions and that's all tied in, like, I think that's a phenomenal opportunity for what, um, public could offer in the future. So again, timestamp this October 27th, 2020. <laughs> I'll circle back in a few years and see if you guys yeah. are doing that. But I do think that that's, that's what's pretty cool about what you're building is viewing it in phases and then listening to your community and what it is they, that they need. If they're not asking for margin, then keep that out. Like no reason to bring it in. But if they're saying, hey, you know, I've actually got a, a lot of money now because I've saved and invested well, I kind of need some help from you know, I'm getting killed on taxes or like I need more help. If you guys are able to provide that in there, that'd be pretty cool. So just some food for thought if you haven't thought about it. Surely. Yeah. yeah. So hey, let's, not get general, you, let's not get oh, you in trouble. We'll, we'll pivot. Oh, good. Oh, good. 
But okay, pivot, go away. Um, <laughs> Keep going. So I don't want to get started. So speaking of like down the road, I, you know, I feel like people like yourself who are forward thinkers, you've built a futuristic company. Um, I mean, it's here today, but when you look at li- and finance, mm-hmm. this is futuristic. What are, what are some things in the fintech, the tech world, the startup world that maybe you see as opportunity that has you excited about what could be coming down the road, whether it's and not necessarily name a company, but what are just opportunities you see coming that are going to continue to bring more access and give accessibility to people um, just in general? Hey, I think hey, two notes. Number one, um, I mean, we are very focused on what we're building, obviously. And so, so you know, that's that's why I'm not necessarily super deep in in, in what everyone else is doing, so to say. But um, I think one thing that we're definitely that I'm personally definitely very excited about is the is all the new um, asset classes that are popping up that are you know suddenly becoming truly accessible to everyone. Right? You were saying that you had Rally Road on, right? Um, I think it's a great example. Otis is a great example. There are a lot of good examples in, you know, being able to invest in real estate, you know, um, and so on. And um, and I think that is going to become super interesting, right? Um, Carta, in terms of likely at some point, I would assume that at some point they will create a marketplace for for you know private um, stock being traded, um, and therefore create like liquidity for any startup employee out there where the company runs on Carta, you know, and things like that. Um, I think that stuff is super, 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 super interesting um, because I think the more access you create to all these different asset classes, you know, the more creative you can, you can build, like the more creative of a portfolio you can build. And I think one big thing is always that, that, you know, that I'm always saying is that when people start to invest, they will likely start with something that they somehow know or understand. And so in public, right, often what people will start is likely is something around, hey, I'm using Amazon every day, right? I have a Netflix subscription. I, you know, really love my Peloton, et cetera, et cetera. And so therefore they will start by buying the things they know. Mm-hmm. And I think if you, if you just, um, you know, if you just open that up even more, um, I think it will just also create more opportunities for people to to start to invest because maybe you might not, you know, maybe you might not be, you know, um, um, super into stocks, for example, but you're super into sneakers, <laughs> and so you might suddenly feel way more comfortable with your first investing experience being around buying into a sneaker than maybe buying into a stock or so on, right? And I think so. So so just creating this like way more broad availability of different, you know, assets that are, that are out there, I think is only helping to, to, you know, make investing in general, a way more mainstream topic. And in general, we always say that, you know, one of the key things that, that we're trying to create is financial literacy for people and just, you know, learning how investing works, learning how money works in general. And it's just a very valuable thing. It's not all about gains at all times, right? Building financial literacy, even if you just put a few bucks in somewhere and then learn by doing through that, I think is a very, very valuable thing. Um, That's just has like, you know, that I think it's just a net positive generally for society. Um, And so the more asset classes you kind of open up, the more opportunities I think, you know, there are for people. And so I think that's something I personally would be saying, I'm very excited about. (laughs) But yeah. It's funny you say that. So in the, in the background, I have this pie chart and I was working on this today, kind of drawing what I think might be the portfolio of the future. And it kind of speaks to what you talked about. So it's 80, per, like I just random numbers, but 80% of the portfolio is your, you know, your total stock market index funds and just basic stuff you buy and hold 10%. Um, I thought, well, what if you're doing individual security? So maybe like a public account. Um, and then like 5% would be in an alternative sleep, which could be like the rally roads of the, of, of the future. And then another two to 5%, depending on allocation is like your Bitcoin holding, which is totally different from what it is today. But I, I do love that the opportunity for the average investor um, to have access to things that truly are uncorrelated from the stock market. You know, think about, you know, not to make this rally, but you know, cars and wine and art, like that stuff trades in a different world on different markets that even in recessions, those things are still selling at all time highs that I've never had access to before. I don't know about you, but I've never had access to that stuff before. So it's kind of cool to think that that's there. 
and then we're not missing out. The only, the only thing that is a little concerning, but where you come at with a good angle is the financial literacy part. You know, the more options we, we introduce to people, the more confusing it can be and the more opportunity there is to, to make mistakes. So I think with these additions of new yeah. asset classes, it's very important for the companies of the future that are going to provide that access to lead with some education as well and make that a part of the platform like, yeah. like you guys have. Yep. I do think it's like, it's that, um, I think what platforms like public and a bunch of other ones, um, you know, especially, you know, even also, you know, rally road and autos and so on are, are really enabling because it's fractionalized is the sense of starting with little amounts. Mm -hmm. And so if you can start with little amounts and obviously de-risk the situation dramatically and, Therefore, in your first experience, you can really focus on building your literacy first before you start dropping your multiple thousands of dollars into your account. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's exactly that 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 you know kind of myth that I think many people still have in their heads right now, where it's a sense of that oh, investing it's something where I need to have like ten grand on the side to really start to make it you know for it to make sense and so on. And it's like yeah, if you purely think about you know, gains, then obviously you need some money that you can have those gains on. But, um, but that's not when you, but that's not necessarily when you maybe should start, right? Maybe you should start earlier because you want to build that literacy first. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is really, I think something that is, that is, that is, you know, I think so, so different that it's now, it's now really just, really just coming up with fractional investing now just really being, you know, literally, we were we, like we were one of the first ones who did real time, uh, real time fractional investing in stocks, and we launched that in September of 2019, right? So a little over a year ago, mm -hmm. and um, so it's like it's super super early, and um, and so but I, but I but I think that it this will really change how people's first investing experiences will really be and how they you know think about um, um, investing, not just from a gains, but just from a sense of building, building that building, building the literacy early on. And then I was gonna add one more thing to it. So I'm sorry, I'm gonna rambling here a little bit because at the end of the day, again, it affects so many other pieces of your life, right? And one thing I'm also often saying is that specifically around the stock market, I think it's a net positive for more people to understand how the stock market works. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, um, um, the stock market is a major component of you know, our economy and our society in a way. And um, it impacts incentives in politics, it impacts incentives in, you know, large companies and all that, you know, and in the end impacts literally, you know, everyone's daily life, you know, within this country and others, you know, that, that's, uh, uh, you know, are majorly driven by that. And so, and so with that, more for more people to have a clear understanding of how the stock market works is at the end of the day net positive for themselves because they you know can actually learn how money works and how investing works and you know learn the magic of compound interest and all these types of things um but then on the other hand also because it's just such a major part of society that for whatever effing reason it's not taught in school mm -hmm. yep well and i think that one of the cool things about you know as you give people who have not had access to things like this before, I've only got to view it as an empowering opportunity for them. So if you've, if you've grown up never having access to, you know, having a bank account or having an investment account because you didn't have enough money, um, now all of a sudden you have access to it for very little. Like now you feel like that's okay, that I can accomplish it. Like, I don't know why I think that that does, but I think that translates and gives people confidence that they can go do more and be more because now there's fewer things that they're held from. Um, you know, the barriers to success are coming down. And even though being able to invest, you know, $50 here and there doesn't necessarily mean they're going to get into a college. I do think that that confidence and those barriers being removed, give them a different look on life that, okay, there's less that's being withheld from me and more that I can go out and achieve. Um, that I, I think there are those psychological effects that we'll never be able to measure, but I, I, deep, I believe deep down that they, they do come through with this stuff. I totally agree. I it's would cool. also really say that generally most people are way smarter than, you know, some of the system might want them to think they are. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, 
and that is really the sense of that. I think it creates confidence if you're able to to experience it yourself and to recognize that, for example, the stock market is not rocket science, right? That there are some clear principles that you can learn and you will, you know, suddenly get the hang of it. And just having even those moments of like, where like your coin drop on, as a, as a German saying, I don't know if it exists in English, your coin drops, it's like you had like a moment of uh, insight. I don't know. Like the, light um, off. the light bulb went off. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, but, but those moments, I think, really create confidence to your point. And I think that confidence is something, you know, I think very important and very positive, you know, for, 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 for people to gain. And so, um, yeah, I have a thousand percent agree. So when you think of public as it sits today, what's your favorite feature about the company and the app and the community? What's your favorite, favorite thing? The thing you look at the most, and you're like, yes, I love that about what we're doing. So it doesn't necessarily have to be an app feature. It could be anything about the company itself. Hey, I would truly say the community. We always say it's very easy to build social features. Um, it's very hard to build community. And I think really I'm, I'm very, you know, I'm sort of say very proud of what we've built there um, because it is truly, truly different, right? Anyone that I pitch this thing, right? The first thing that people always comes to mind is like, cool, man, where's the leaderboard? because their mind goes to stock training, show off your gains, right? Where's the leaderboard? How can I follow the person that has the best gains last week? You know? And we're always like, no, 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 no. This is not what this is about. This is different. And to truly have built a community where that is truly the case in a space that has been the way it has been literally since inception, I think that's where the true disruption really came in. And yes, it's obviously fueled by the product that we've built and all the kind of stuff. But in the end of the day, everything plays with each other, right? It's a accumulation of, 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 of all the moves that, that, that were made. But then when we got it to this point, oh, fucking awesome. Mm -hmm. So love it. All right. So, final question. Um, and everybody gets the same final question. So, you've had success along your entrepreneurial journey, moving in and out of the agency, starting multiple companies and starting public, which I like, I already liked it a lot. I, I love it even more today, just because whether you know it or not, your passion for what you've built and like the passion for the community is you can't fake that. And through Zoom and through this conversation, I can tell that's really what you excites you and what you're about. And, and I love that. Um, so w when having that success, what would you say is your superpower? Um, so what's the characteristic about yourself that's allowed you to build public and reach your goals that separates you from other founders that are out there? I know it sounds like a very, uh, we have to now kind of pat myself on the back and say what I'm really awesome at. <laughs> You're putting me in, a, in an uncomfortable position as a German. Um, <laughs> hey, um, for me personally, I would always say one thing that I'm personally good at is hacking attention. Um, I always say that my personal superpower is hacking attention. And I think hacking attention is obviously accumulation of multiple things, but it's, you know, um, um, but it's basically, you know, um, so to say being very considered on what type of brand we're building and not just in terms of how you design something, how you write something, but in terms of the moves you're actually making. And, um, you know, and certainly we always say that, you know, your brand is built by everything you do. Um, and it's because at the end of the day, what your brand really is, is what someone else thinks about you. Mm -hmm. um, and you're trying to influence that, right? And so, you know, whatever company says, oh, our brand is this and this. It's like, no, 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 you should ask whatever your users are, or even the ones that churned what your brand is, right? <laughs> right. At the end of the day, your brand... Like your brand is what people think about you, right? And you try to influence what people think about you as much as possible. And, um, and I truly believe that, you know, that, you know, that perception is, the mo is mostly impacted by, um, by how you actually act. And how you act is really done by just everything you do, right? How your customer service team speaks, how you write an FAQ article to what, but what color that button has down to, you know, down to the community you might build and so on. And so, um, 
and so I think in that in that regard, I would say my superpower is, uh, uh, is uh, hacking attention, and that is you know truly done by um, you know so to say caring about little details and how they play together. Uh, it's great. It's, it's okay to to brag on yourself a little bit. Like there's nothing wrong with that. You <laughs> are, you're extremely humble. It doesn't come across as arrogant at all. But I want people to start listening and pulling from like, oh, you know, I kind of see that in myself as well. And you know, the the point of the question is to help listeners maybe identify their superpower. And sometimes it's hard to see it. But if you hear somebody else describe a strength of yours, then maybe now you found your superpower and you can double down on that and, and it leads to success. So I thought that was I thought that was great. Um, well, life as we wrap up, where can everybody follow? Like, where do you want to direct them to, to, to you know, Twitter, to the website? I'll link to all these over on allaboutyourbenjamins.com. Get yourself go to public.com and get yourself an account and join the community. That's for sure. Um, then obviously follow us at, at public on Twitter. Um, you can follow myself on live thunder on Twitter, L E I F thunder. There's a little backstory to the thunder. Um, that's, going to be on a different podcast one day but <laughs> um that's kind of it man yeah sounds good well i will link to all those well i, I really appreciate you uh taking the time and we'll get the thunder story when i have you come back as you guys roll out more features because you know i want to keep everybody up to date with what you guys are doing so whenever more features come out and more pub more things become public we'll get the thunder story as the lead-in so i appreciate your time and sharing the story i also appreciate what you're building and the passion behind it um you know for somebody who deals with people in their finances and seeing how few people have a good grasp of it. I think what you're building at public is going to help a lot of people. So from a, an advisor to, to the FinTech world, thank you for doing what you're doing and keep that focus. I think we need it. Um, and everybody, thank you all for watching. If you're watching on YouTube, listening to this on the podcast, like, share, all that stuff. I hate asking for it, but, but please do it if you feel compelled. Um, and with that, uh, we'll see you all in the next episode.